Are word problems your favorite things? As in, given a choice between spending an evening binge-watching Netflix and doing word problems, are word problems your first choice? Nah, I know. <laughs> For most of us, the answer is no. Follow-up question. How good are you at constructing the word problem? So we're not just talking about solving the word problem once it's all the pertinent facts and figures and ideas are laid out for you, but like figuring out what you need to include in order to create the word problem in the first place. That's tricky, isn't it? Today, we're going to start the next phase of learning the back propagation rule for neural networks, specifically a multilayer perceptron. And the very first step that we're going to take is we're going to figure out what needs to be considered in order to create the word problem that leads to the equations. Now, when I was thinking about this vid over the past couple of days and early this morning, what, what really came up for me was it's, it's not just the basic setting up the fundamental equation the de partial derivative from which we're going to do all sorts of mechanical steps, chain rule steps, and get a result. It's what do you have to go through mentally to come up with that equation in the first place? And as I was thinking about it, even more important is as you go through the mental process of creating this in your mind, what does it imply? What does it necessarily imply about the structure and the operation or the flow through of the MLP, the multilayer perceptron. Join me. I'm Dr. AJ Aliana J. Moran. You're here with me in AI after hours, but it's too early. It's actually rooster hours, as you can hear from the background. I'm on my first cup of coffee. Nothing like getting an early start. Let's dive in, shall we? You've joined me for the Neural Network's Back Propagation series, and here we are in part two. We're investigating mathematical dependence. In short, we're looking at how to set up the word problem that is the basis for the back propagation method. Throughout this vid and throughout the entire series, we're going to be addressing a multi layer perceptron, a neural network with a three layer structure, input, middle, and output layers. In the previous vid in the series, we took a look at the series overview and identified that in this particular vid, the second vid, we would be looking at the notion of dependency or how it is that we set up our word problem. In the vid right after this one, we'll be taking a look at the chain rule. Let's briefly recap the points made in the previous vid about this notion of dependency. What we want is to find the dependence of the summed squared error, that's abbreviated as SSE, on each of the specific connection weights. Now we have two different kinds of connection weights. There are those going from the middle layer or the hidden layer to the output. That's going to be in video number five. And then a somewhat more complex derivation where we're going to look at the connection weights going from the input to the hidden layers. That will be in vid six. The subscripts are being counted Python style. So for example, when we see a network that has five nodes on the bottom layer, the input layer, and four nodes on the hidden layer, and we see W with subscripts four, three, being the connection between that last or fifth node in the input to the last or fourth node in the hidden, the subscripts indicate that we're counting Python style, where the input nodes are being counted zero up through four, and the hidden nodes are being counted zero up through three. Even though our goal across this series of videos is to actually derive the equations for the back propagation method, in this particular vid, we're going to focus just on setting up the word problem nature. That is, what we're looking for is an origin story. The book that I'm writing, even though it's very much in progress, is available in its various parts on my website. So if you would like to have the chapters that go along with these video tutorials, please go to my website, alianajmarin.com. From there, click on the book tab, scroll down, find the orange box, and that will have a link to the table of contents. Please click there, and most of what we're going to want is in part two. Now, back to our main theme. 
One more little aside before we go on. Most of you would recall that when you're doing differential calculus, you use dy dx as sort of a formalism for expressing the derivative of one thing, like y, with respect to another, like x. And here, you're seeing a lot of use of the partial derivative sign, which is a little Greek delta, instead of a d. So this is the difference between a, a regular derivative and a partial derivative. If this were a regular derivative, SSE would be a function of just one thing. It would be a function of V, presuming that there was just one connection weight. But actually, we've got many possible connection weights. And when we want to look at the dependence of some squared error, or SSE, on a very specific connection weight, we take the partial derivative, which says we're interested in one possible dependence route out of many possibilities that exist. So we're using partial differential notation because in our derivation, we've got two different kinds of connection weights. We've got the w's, the input to hidden, and also the v's, the hidden to output. And in addition to that, for each of those different kinds of weights, we have a full set of possible connections. One final comment. The mathematics for doing a regular derivative are exactly the same as doing a partial. So all that we've learned in that first semester of calculus still applies. So let's go back to the idea of creating an origins story in the classic sense of storytelling to create a word problem. If we go back as far as the Enuma Elish, probably the oldest origin story in the world, we see it starting off with when on high the heaven had not been named, and it goes on as it's a full epic. But maybe we don't need to go back that far. Maybe we just need to go back to the Perceptron as originally envisioned by Frank Rosenblatt in 1958. So our origin story begins in the very late 1950s with Frank Rosenblatt inventing the Perceptron, and within a short time, in 1960, Bernie Woodrow and his graduate student Marcian Hoff together invent the Adeline, and for the multiple Adelines together, Madeline neural networks. Both of those networks had the same structure and form that we have in multilayer perceptrons today, some 60 years later. What they had in common, and that which we still use, are the notion of structured layers, where the information feeds from one into another, and in fact, the idea of having an association layer or a middle layer that aggregated information from multiple sources. They had the ideas of very specific connection weights from each node in each layer connecting to the next. Also, both of those networks had the notion of a feedback capability, a simple training that allowed them each to differentiate between linearly separable classes. The problem was neither of them could go beyond linear separability. Neither, for example, could solve the XOR or the exclusive OR problem. So there we were, early 1960s, and neural networks, which had begun with a promising start, were stalled out. It didn't help at all that in 1968, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert wrote a book entitled Perceptrons, where they logically dissected the perceptron architecture and came to the conclusion that with the learning methods available at the time, there was no way that a perceptron, even one with a middle layer, a hidden layer, could effectively solve interesting problems. For all practical purposes, neural network research stalled out, and from the early 1960s up through the mid-1970s, not much got done. Now that's an oversimplification. There were several researchers abroad who put together the first instances of chain rule derivations that would solve that problem. And in 1974, Paul Werbus was the first in the United States to solve that problem as part of his PhD dissertation. The key insight that Werbus had, and where he was the first to make it applicable to neural networks, is that he realized we needed a differentiable transfer function. In the previous networks, the perceptron and in the Adeline slash Madeline, the transfer function was an either-or binary decision that kept it from learning more subtle and complex problems. Once this differentiable transfer function was introduced, the chain rule could then be applied to backpropagate the impact of the sum squared error at the output throughout both sets of connection weights 
resulting in much more complex ability. So with that, what we've created is not only that key, crucial, first partial differential equation from which everything else will flow. We'll do all of our mechanical steps coming out of that, and it'll actually be fairly straightforward. Once we get the flow going, it'll be kind of easy, even kind of fun, you know, in the sense of crossword puzzle or Sudoku or whatever your favorite mental exercise is. It'll be fun. But what we've got is something much more important and much more all-encompassing, and that is we've understood now that to set up a functional multilayer perceptron, something that gives us the results that we want, we necessarily have a certain kind of architecture, we necessarily have a certain kind of flow through, we necessarily must have certain constraints on our transfer functions. So please join me. Once again, I'm Dr. Aliana J. Moren. You're here with me in AI After Hours. This has been video number two in the backpropagation series. We've already had videos one, which were the series overview and introduction, going through the different vids that we would have. This is number two. And then we had video number zero, which was the motivation and rationale. So coming up next, we're going to have the chain rule. The chain rule in all of its multifarious little parts and components Every little step that we need to have on hand is kind of like creating a mise-en-scene. It's like being a chef who assembles all the requisite ingredients for a fancy meal ahead of time. So all the chopped onions are in one little bowl, all the chopped celery is in another, the spices are all laid out, and when it comes time to assemble, it's very easy. What we're going to do is that. We're then going to do all the necessary little partial differential steps, and then when it comes to actually working the whole back propagation derivation, they'll be right at our fingertips, easy to flow. In the video after that, we'll take a look at this transfer function and its derivative. Then, in videos five and six in this series, we'll carry out this back propagation derivation and follow up with getting an intuition in video seven as to how this works and what this means. We'll understand both the strengths and limitations, and why it is that even with the power of backpropagation, we hit yet another neural network's winter and had to find an alternative method for more complex problems. To make sure that you get all the vids in this series with or without the roosters, please go to my YouTube channel and do the like, subscribe, and notify. See you soon. Thanks for joining me.